Impassioned pleas, but no statewide mandate on masks in schools. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Anna Staver, State House reporter for the Columbus Dispatch, Terry Casey, Republican strategist, and Sam Gresham of Common Cause Ohio. COVID spread continues in Ohio and the pace is quickening. All but one county in Ohio is red on the CDC's rate of transmission map. All of those red counties have a high rate of COVID transmission. One, the one orange county, Ashtabula County, has a substantial rate of transmission, so not much better. The rate of new daily COVID cases is up sharply as are hospitalizations. So far, ICU admissions remain fairly flat and the death rate thankfully remains low and flat. But with fall approaching, we're getting back together, coming inside. Students are back in the classroom. And Governor DeWine this week pleaded with schools to make kids wear masks. This year, when your children go to school, if I can judge by what I'm reading in the, in the newspaper, many, many, many schools, at least at this point, are not planning on requiring masks. So therefore, we're gonna have this perfect storm. And it's at a high rate, much more contagious, and now kids are no longer protected in the classroom with wearing masks, which we have shown is very, very, very um, good at blocking at blocking the virus. And Stephen, the governor basically said this coming school year is worse than last year, especially for younger kids who cannot get the vaccine because now with a more contagious Delta variant, the kids aren't going to be masked, so it's that perfect storm, but yet he's not issuing any statewide mandate. What is his reasoning? Well, that depends on who you ask. Uh, Democrats like Nan Whaley, who's running for governor, say it's a political one. Um, the legislature passed a bill, um, SB 22, which would basically give them the authority to immediately overturn a mask mandate. And they likely would. Um, so she says he won't do it because it'll be overturned and it would look bad for his primary. Um, Jim Renacy, who's running against him, is adamantly against masks, as are some of the Republicans in the legislature. Um, DeWine says that people are just, they have fatigue and that it's going to be a personal choice, especially as vaccines continue to roll out. Um, so I guess it's a question of uh, which one you think is true. Terry Casey, the governor, he could issue the mandate and the legislature is not in session. So it would take a few weeks for them to come back and overturn his mandate. And he would likely veto it. And then they would override his veto. And then he would have a pretty good constitutional argument that they've infringed on his right as an executive to issue this order. Why not, why not go, to, go, to, go to the mat if he thinks this is a, quote, perfect storm? Well, there is a certain amount of fatigue, and to his credit, he's doing the Paul Revere uh, sounding of the alarm of what's coming. And I think the good thing for Ohio is we can look at national maps like I do of the New York Times, and we can see the bad numbers coming in parts of the South, including Florida and Texas, Louisiana. And I think people are better prepared now to realize this is real and it's coming and it's worse. The other factor is in Ohio, we've got over 600 different school districts, uh, several thousand buildings, and some districts like Columbus have over 100 different buildings with different layouts, configurations, ventilation system. So it's hard in a state as big and diverse as Ohio to make one size fits all and perfectly work for every district throughout the state. But Terry, wouldn't a, wouldn't a mask mandate solve that problem? It doesn't matter the well, ventilation. It doesn't matter the size of the school, the size of the classroom. If you had a mask mandate, you, that solves the problem for every school district. Yeah. But some situations, you don't need the masks as much as you do of others. It's like in Franklin County, there's some districts that are just doing it K through eight because a lot of the seniors, those in senior high school, nine, 10, 11, and 12, have been vaccinated. So I think the idea of local choice, local option, but the governor still sounding the alarm as far as what's coming up, I think is the best combination because ultimately, you need the people's cooperation and their work to all be rowing in the same direction. Sam Gresham, another part of this perfect storm the governor talks about, but he didn't mention, is the fact that the place where mask resistance is the fiercest 
are, are all the pla also the places where vaccines are the fewest. So it's, it's, it's kind of a two-pronged problem there. When historians look back at this period, they're going to ask themselves, how could the populace and the political leadership be so ignorant? And they're going to ask themselves, there's a vaccine available. If you wear masks, you reduce the possibility of infection. And why are people fighting this? And the Republicans are threatening the governor. Uh, everybody's got a position on it. I'll tell you what mine is. Don't wear a mask, don't take vaccine, and you will die. Yeah, Stavery, if you look at the polls, there's no real Ohio poll that I've seen, but the Kaiser Family Foundation did a national poll and said almost two thirds of Americans support mandating masks for kids in schools, but 44% of Republicans, uh, only only 44% of Republicans support it. So it's six in 10 of Republicans oppose the masks. And that's the, those are the numbers politically that Mike DeWine is likely looking at. Yeah, and I think he's also looking at the practicality of getting into a pissing match with the legislature. Like, yes, he could do it and they could come back and overturn it. And that could probably all happen within two to three weeks. Um, and yes, you could go to court. But I think he's probably asking himself if this is the hill he wants to die on. I know he's really pushing masks, but he I think he made a pretty compelling argument, at least for me. I have school aged children, as you can tell by the artwork behind me. But Indeed. um the quarantine policy is really what he's emphasizing now. He's like, whether or not you think masks are effective, um, if your child is unvaccinated and unmasked, they have to stay home for 10 days following an exposure. If they are vaccinated, then they just have to wear a mask and get tested. But if everyone in the classroom was wearing a mask, then there's no need to quarantine. And for me, I'm like, well, if my kid wears the mask, that means that we're not going to be looking at rolling two week work from home situations with the kid. And I think that's probably more compelling than like the mask is effective for some people. It's like, do you really want your kid at home for two weeks? Terry Casey, now Anna explained that consequence very well, but are people in the rural areas listening to that or is it going to take an outbreak at one of these schools for them to really understand, you know, this stuff is serious and this variant is real and kids are going to have to take missed class because of the, they get infected or get close to someone infected. Well, there's definitely parts of Ohio. I'm originally from Coshocton County, and it's one of the five lowest counties in the state, along with Holmes County, where the Amish are, that's the lowest of the 88 counties. So there's definitely gaps. But my hope is that as people see what's happening in the South and other areas, they're going to wake up and realize that the vaccine's important and it does work and it's effective. Uh, and that you need to do other things in terms of distancing, being safe in terms of where you're at and what you're doing. So I'm not saying everybody overnight's going to get the word, but I think we've got a chance this time to uh, ramp up the progress and awareness. Okay. In the race for U.S. Senate, the race to succeed outgoing Senator Rob Portman, there are a slew of Republicans running. Up until this week, just one big-name Democrat, Congressman Tim Ryan of the Youngstown area. Well, now he has a serious competitor. Ryan will face Morgan Harper in next year's primary. Harper is a progressive activist. She ran and lost to Congresswoman Joyce Beatty in the 2020 Democratic primary. Before then, she worked for Richard Cordray at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in Washington, something she touts in her introductory video. I've been taking on big tech, trying to break up multinational monopolies that have been crushing workers, small businesses, and threatening our democracy. Here at home, we've been organizing communities left behind. I'm here. I actually came tonight. To get political power back on our side. Sam Gresham, Morgan Harper is getting better known, largely, of course, because of her appearances here on Columbus on the Record, which will have to stop for a while. But she did run against Joyce Beatty, and, uh, uh, it, and it, she got a lot of attention right away. The New York Times put it on their website right away. She raised $250,000 right off the bat, according to her campaign. Does she have a shot against Tim Ryan? This is one of those races that I, 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 it's hard to predict on. I think Mark Morgan... It may be a little premature on a statewide basis, but she's a good candidate. With the districts that exist in the redistricting, uh, Franklin County will probably have two congressional seats. And I thought that would have been a better strategy, but she's made this decision. 
to go forward with the senatorial seat. I wish her wish her well. I, I I'm concerned about the Democratic candidates. Period. Nobody has a lot of money to run a statewide race. A senatorial race takes a lot of money, and I don't see that money just drip 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 in. Uh, I think the Republicans are going to have more money. I don't think the Republicans have the better candidates. And unfortunately, money always wins out when you don't have enough of it and you're a good candidate. Terry Casey, I assume Republicans, should she make it through the primary, maybe even before, are going to label her as a socialist, someone who wants to defund or abolish the police, someone who wants to open up the borders? Is that uh, the talking points they're going to use against her? Uh, I don't really know because she's not going to be the nominee. She's bright and articulate. I've enjoyed meeting and talking with her while on this program. But the difficulty is when you want to run for a big office like Congress and you haven't been anywhere before, it's hard. But if you want to run statewide in a complicated state like Ohio, 11 and a half million people, and you've got no name ID, no base, no office that you're in, it's really tough. So she needs to run for something she can win first instead of just trying to aim higher and higher in terms of your ambitions. So again, she's bright, articulate, and capable. She'll raise some national money as she did for Congress, uh, but Republicans aren't sitting around worrying about attack points on her because the nominee is going to be Tim Ryan. But Tim Ryan, Anna Staver, will have to pay attention to Morgan Harper, at least a little bit, um, whether she makes it all the way to the ballot or not. Um, and the thinking is she may pull him farther to the left, perhaps farther to the left that he wants to be as he tries to win statewide in Ohio. Yeah, um, I mean, you could look at the the race, uh, the recent primary between Chantel Brown and Nina Turner. You know, Chantel Brown, who embraced Biden, um, ultimately won, but that that race definitely had a lot of money and a lot of attention paid to it. And I think this will be the same way. Um, but yeah, I mean, Morgan Harper has a great narrative. You know, she she had a, she grew up with a single mother. She got herself into Princeton and then to Stanford for law. She has very progressive views and sort of modeled herself after AOC. And I absolutely think if they get to a debate stage together, there's a chance that she could force him into a corner on certain issues that he'd rather um, leave a little more ambiguous, shall we say, until we get to the general. Okay. Uh, look, looking at the Republican side of the primary, there was a poll that came out earlier this month. It was done by uh, former President Trump's pollster, who is now working for J.D. Vance's PAC. And no surprise, it shows J.D. Vance gaining some strength in the race. Josh Mandel had the lead with about 20% or so. Vance was next with 12, Jane Timken with eight. Anna Staver, that shows you, first of all, that name ID still rules early on. Half Republicans are still undecided. Yeah, um, and then the Mandel campaign also released their own internal poll, which I always am hesitant about since, you know, they wouldn't release an internal poll unless it was good. But even theirs showed, um, you know, 33% of the electorate undecided. I think we're a long way out from the primary. I think, you know, um, my I always like to use my in-laws as an example. They're they're conservative Republicans from Northeast Ohio, and they don't even know all the names in the race yet. Like they haven't even started looking at this yet. And I think they're indicative of where a lot of people are. They know Josh Mandel because he's run statewide before, but the rest of the candidates they really haven't looked at yet. Terry Casey, Jane Timken, the former head of the Republican Party. You know, marginal name recognition statewide was back in this poll. I don't know where she was in Mandel's poll, but does that surprise you at all? Not really, because the Timken name is more known around Canton and Stark County. It's not as well known other than with political junkies statewide. And again, it gets to the point, Ohio is a big, diverse state. Uh, seven or eight big media markets, 11 and a half million people. You just don't get known and normally win on your first time out. So right now, Josh Bandell is benefiting from three different times he's been on the statewide ballot. The question is, what does he have next to do? Uh, and clearly, this is going to be a long saga. I'll do my prediction early on WOSU. It's going to be about every other week we're going to talk about something on the U.S. Senate race, Democrat, Republican, or both, because it's going to be such a hot, perplexing, uh, amazing kind of issue between now and May. Sam Gresham, probably far-fetched, but stranger things have happened. 
What would a Josh Mandel Morgan Harper general election race look like? Boy, that would be one. I'd pay a million dollars to be in the first <laughs> row to see how that goes. Mandel's an interesting candidate. He's the guy that took Kevin Boyce and made him into a terrorist, made him into an Arab terrorist. How do you take Kevin Boyce, our county commissioner, and make him into a terrorist? I don't know how he did that, but he did that. I, 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 I would pay a couple hundred bucks to sit in the front row to watch him go through his campaign because he's going he's gonna to attack everybody from Mother Teresa to the Pope. Yes. All right, next topic. Some state House Republicans want to return Ohio's voting law to where it was in 2004. Remember 2004, Bush versus Kerry? That was the year with the really long lines at the polling places. Well, a new bill would make it harder to vote in Ohio. It would eliminate no-fault mail-in voting. That's unless a voter is disabled or out of the country. It would ban drop boxes for early voting. It would limit early in-person voting to 13 days next year, then to just six days after that, and it would require voters to show a photo ID, not just a current bill or a paycheck as you can now. This bill joins another bill which is not as restrictive, and the sponsor of that bill, State Rep Bill Sites, told the dispatch, this new bill makes his, modest, his bill seem modest and reasonable in comparison. Terry Casey, you know the whole good cop, bad cop strategy. Is this good bill, bad bill strategy in the part of Republicans throw out a real draconian bill to make the other one, which is also restrictive, seem a little better? Well, sometimes Republicans are organized and creative, but I don't think they've got it down quite that well. I think clearly there's a few more extreme Republicans that want to take us back that far in history, but I don't think most Ohioans, including the leadership in the House and Senate, or the governor want to go back and go that far because Ohio's system in general under Secretary of State Frank LaRose has worked well, including last year. And voters like the idea of being able to vote early, vote by mail or vote in their neighborhood on Election Day. That's working. Uh, and there's a few minor problems, but nothing big. I don't see anything extreme like that proposal going anywhere. And Stafer, mail-in voting is very popular, not just among one party. Both parties like it. Older folks like it. They don't have to, they can take their time, they can mail it in. It just seems like that's a fight that's not worth fighting because you're not going to win it, I don't think, the mail-in voting part. I think that there are bills introduced in the legislature because you ha you really want them to become law. And then I think there are bills that perhaps are, and I'm not saying this is true of Representative Bill Dean, that the representative who introduced this more restrictive bill. But I think there are some that you do so that you can tell your constituents that you've done them or you can run on them, but they're probably never going to go anywhere. And I think this is probably one of those because, I mean, it eliminates military ID as a form of acceptable ID at the ballot, right? It's driver's license, state ID or passport. That's it. Um, and I think that that feels like a pretty extreme like reduction in the uh, um, not only in early voting and acceptable days. So I, I I think that this is something that probably Representative Dean believes in and will campaign on. But I, I, I think sites is more much more likely to be the vehicle. Sam Gresham, I mean, the sponsors of this new bill say, you know, Election Day is Election Day. I mean, we voted on Election Day for years and Democrats won, Republicans won. Is it wrong to think we should go back to that and eliminate some of these things that are so controversial? No, I disagree wholeheartedly. There's no need to make any changes at this point. What we are looking at is the Republican Party is having a war and watching that war. The old America is changing to a new America. And the Republicans can't go on the marketplace of ideas to the new America. So the best way that they can handle that is to cheat. So they can change the rules to make it very difficult for people to vote. Now, if you go back and look at the absentee ballot, it came to us in 2005 as a result of Ron Reform Ohio Now. The polls were showing that people in Ohio supported absentee ballot so well, the General Assembly gave it to us. I think this is another example of where the General Assembly is misreading the public uh, on these issues and are getting in line with Alex. And most people don't know this. 
Alex is the group that produced most of this legislation um, that they are now looking at. They're getting in line with the rest of the Republicans. I will make you a, a, a bet. It's going to backfire on them. So keep it up. We don't worry about that. That's my next question to you, Terry. Sam's fired up. Could it backfire in that it energizes Democrats, particularly African-American Democrats, who historically right. have been affected by, you know, voter restrictions? Other than this week, that one more extreme bill has gotten a tiny bit of attention, but nobody's really paying attention. It's not going to be a big issue. It's not going to be passed. It's going to be basically business as usual. And by the way, Ohio, for the past decade or so, has been one of the 10 most liberal states in the union in terms of the flexibility, in terms of how and where we can vote. So unlike some states like Delaware and New York and some others, which are much more restrictive on early voting and vote by mail and other kind of things, Ohio has been a good leader, has good laws, and they're going to stay that way. And uh, evidence, You know, Mike, evidence, I, I, I would accept Terry's statement if it wasn't for the League of Women Voters, if it wasn't for the uh, Common Cause of Ohio, and in a sundry of other people who for the last 20 years have been fighting to get those things on board. That is not something that the Republican General Assembly just said, puff, that's a good idea. We've been fighting with them for 25 years to get those things done. It didn't happen out of the benevolence of their heart. Uh, don't give anybody that impression, Mr. Casey. It's a fact, Sam. It's true. That's the laws we have right now. Right. And how did you get it? It's been controlled mostly, well, since the 1990s by Republicans. All right, let's get to the next topic, our final topic really quickly. On Monday, Ohio's voters will have their say on how lawmakers draw legislative districts, state legislative districts. How much lawmakers listen to them remains to be seen. But the Redistricting Commission holds its first public hearing in Cleveland on Monday. The panel will hold 10 public hearings next week all over the state, except Columbus. The commission does not have any proposed maps yet. It promises more hearings once they have some maps. Lawmakers better hurry. The first deadline for a state legislative district map is September 1st, with an extension of September 15th. Sam Gresham, you're with Common Cause, big supporter of anti-gerrymandering maps, fairer districts. How optimistic are you that this process will work? Well, we're ahead of them. Uh, we've been holding hearings around the state of Ohio for the last three months. We've had as many as 500 people attend our hearings. We are working on a map that will meet all the criteria that are developed. We're not going to let the General Assembly create a map. We're going to go into that first, per first public hearing with our map to present. And every public hearing following that, we're going with our map. And we're coming with a report that justifies why our map meets the criteria, And we're going to make uh, the General Assembly and the uh, deal with the reality of what the citizens said. Over 70% of the citizens on two times said they want fair maps. We're going to give them a fair map. And, and, and Casey, before you start, the Supreme Court is a lot more liberal now. So if we have to sue y'all and go to the Supreme Court, we think we got a chance. All right, Terry, you're, you're up now. Uh, why don't the lawmakers have a map to counter their map if, if they have one on Monday? Well, part of it is explain the process because it's a brand new process. And I predict next week you're going to hear Chicken Little yelling that the sky is falling and civilization is going to end in Ohio unless we adopt whatever Sam and some of his people want. The reality is certain legislative leaders and a lot of key Democrats like Joyce Beatty, they've got their ideas and input on how they want the districts drawn. And some districts have grown in population like Joyce's, some have shrunk like the African-American one up in the Cleveland Akron area. So there's going to be a lot of bipartisan input, including from the two sites, the father who's a state senator and the daughter who's the Ohio House minority leader. So it's going to be very bipartisan. There's a lot of interest. There's a lot of questions like in Franklin County that's over 1.3 million that could have 12 different districts. Do you create two or three or four African-American Democrat House districts here as an example. So there's going to be a lot of bipartisanship. But next week, 
it's all going to be the sky is falling. And unless this is adopted, uh, nobody's going to be able to sleep at night in Ohio. All right, we'll see what happens. Time now for our final off-the-record parting shots. Sam, you're first. I think the, the public needs to know it's time to start screaming. Uh, the Democrats have not passed that legislation on voting in Ohio. And second, we're starting this process on Monday. So you need to start screaming. If not, the Republicans are going to take your rights away from you. All right. And Terry Casey, you're next. My prediction is, sadly, as we saw by late this week, the zoo has turned into a bit of a zoo. Uh, <laughs> with, uh, well, excuse me, it's turned into a circus uh, because there's been some serious questions on abuse of how the money's been spent. So I think there's going to be a lot more, and it's going to be more than the executives. It'll involve some board members, but they need real reform there in terms of their board membership and the quality of the board. And Anna Staver. With the artwork behind um, you. Yes. Uh, so uh, redistricting is not the only meeting happening next week. Lawmakers are actually coming back early to talk about vaccines. Um, they're trying to move forward a bill that would prevent businesses, hospitals, schools, basically any company here in Ohio from mandating employees get vaccinated. And so we'll be watching to see how that goes. Yeah. Also, a couple of concert venues in Columbus are mandating their attendee the folks attending the concert be vaccinated or proof of a negative test and causing a lot of chatter on social media we'll see if it leads to loud chatter at the concert venue on concert night that is columbus on the record for this week please check us out online you can see each and every episode whenever you want to at our website wosu.org cotr for our crew and for our panel and for the artist work behind anna staver i'm mike thompson have a good week